Hello, welcome to Insight Memory Care Center for the monthly care partner training. This month is Stay Steady, Cognition and Balance with Dr. Julie Reese. Our mission is to provide specialized care, support, and education for individuals in all stages of memory and cognitive impairment, their partners, and the community. Our vision is a community where those living with memory or cognitive impairment and their care partners can achieve the highest quality of life. We are a leader in dementia care in Northern Virginia. Insight is a nonprofit started in 1984 that supports families on their dementia journey. We provide specialized care, adult day programs for people in all stages of their dementia journey. Through connection, we build relationships and supporting care partners on their journey. And using creativity, our dementia experts share their knowledge and resources because every journey is unique. Supporting families in their journey, Insight is a nonprofit organization that relies on the generosity of people like you to engage people with dementia and support their care partners. There's a couple of ways that you can do that. Through your IRA and other gifts, monthly donation, workplace giving, or we have two events a year, the Painting and Pairings and Insight Gala, which is held in October, and our Legacy Breakfast, which is held in the spring. If you'd like to learn more about any of these options, please feel free to go on insightmcc.org slash events. We have a bunch of great events coming up um, in the next quarter. We have author highlights and movie premieres with Q and A's, additional care partner training, Alzheimer's disease and dementia care seminar, virtual dementia tour, caregiving at a glance workshop. So please feel free to look at all of these on insightmcc.org slash events and sign up and be a part of all of these events. Now, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Julie Reese. She's a physical therapist and educator and research and special interest in rehab within for individuals with dementia. She's a professor of physical therapy and senior research fellow at the Center of Optimal Aging at Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia. Julie has provided presentations nationally and internationally on rehabilitation for older adults with dementia and especially interested in falls and balance. She has a longstanding relationship with Insight Memory Care Center involving research and educational activities and is excited to join the care partner group to discuss fall prevention. Without further ado, welcome Dr. Julie Reese. Projects, oops, it's recording in progress. Um, several research projects. And so uh, the research projects that I'm involved in right now have to do with balance and individuals with mild cognitive impairment or with diagnosis of dementia. So those are kind of my areas of um, uh, true passion. So that's, oh, I like it. Oh, there we go. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about, you know, we're, we're coming on spring now, and I was thinking about, oh, fall. Fall should be such a great word. Fall should be something that we're always looking forward to. But as we get older, the context of falls is really different. And so, should I get a mask out? No, you're fine. Okay. And so, um, I think it's important for us. To, hi, welcome. I think it's really in person. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we have a couple of in-person people here now too. So you're going to be the focus of my attention okay. over the whole time. <laughs> so we're talking about balls. So when we think about this, I think it's important for us to consider, in the context of as we're aging, what should we expect and what should we not expect. And so here's a true false question for you. True or false, falls are a normal part of aging. So think about it a minute. Um, oh, I heard a true, I heard a true. <laughs> but guess what? Falls are not a normal part of aging and we shouldn't take it sitting down. Falls are something that we, can, <laughs> we shouldn't take it on the floor. Falls are something that we can really combat. And so hopefully we'll talk today about some of the things that we can do to keep ourselves more stable, upright, safe, 
Um, but falls are not a normal and expected part of aging. That's not what we should be thinking is definitively waiting for us um, as we get older. How about this one? Most falls are preventable. We hear true, right? Absolutely true. So there are many, many uh, things that we can do to minimize our risk of falling. And so I want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, there's a whole list of things here that have to do with protecting ourselves from falls. So uh, if we look at the data on this, we generally think that up to 75% of falls that occur are preventable. And so all of these different risk factors are things that we have the ability to change. So inactivity is our big enemy. So you know what they say? Sitting is the new smoking. So we spend so much time sitting. And there are a lot of different things we can do to bit by bit fight away at inactivity. And even if it's something like standing up at the commercials of the program that you're watching, taking a lap around the house uh, at regular intervals, it doesn't have to be a major investment. It could be something kind of minimal that just gets you off of your bottom more frequently. So inactivity is one of the big things that we can battle and be a little bit safer. Leg weakness is one of those things that is not inevitable, but it can creep up on us as we age. And that has to do with bullet number one, inactivity. And so the idea of really kind of thinking about how do I maintain good strength is something we should probably be thinking about a little bit more. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Balance issues, so the great news, and here if you learn nothing else today, learn this, we can all improve upon our balance. We can get better at balance. And if we get better at balance, it will translate to better safety in upright. And that's important. So we're gonna to talk today about balance. When somebody uses a cane or a walker, they're automatically at a little bit higher risk for falling. And so one of the things that can be problematic is that everybody's cane or walker doesn't necessarily fit them well. And that's something that can make somebody at a higher risk for falling. And everybody who has a cane or walker doesn't necessarily use it correctly. So those are things that can be modified, that can be changed. Um, and as a physical therapist, that's kind of one of the areas that I really focus on. And if, if, I am, if I'm out in the community and I see somebody misusing an assistive device, I have a really hard time containing myself and not suggesting that we refit it or I su may suggest a different way of utilizing it. Other things like visual challenges. So one of the primary things that keeps us upright and safe is the information that comes to us through our eyes. And so if somebody's eyewear is not well suited for them, or as you may know, a lot of falls happen at nighttime. You get up to use the bathroom at night. You don't want to turn the light on because you don't want to wake your sleeping partner. And with that darkness, your risk for falling increases. And we can combat that. You know, there's such a thing as motion sensor floorboard lighting. You could just get that so that when you get up and you get out of bed and your feet hit the floor, the floorboard lights go on. So there are ways, again, to kind of combat these things. Medication has a big contribution to falls. A lot of older adults, as we age, we end up taking lots of different medications. And as you have higher numbers of medications on board, that seems to correlate with a bigger fall risk too. So one of the things we always suggest is to have your physician or a, pharma a pharmacist help look through medications review. Blood pressure responsiveness. Some people fall because their blood pressure doesn't acclimate to their position changes as well as it should. So again, that's kind of a medical issue, but one that can be managed. 
um, in conjunction with your primary care physician. And then here's one that we think about a lot is just the environment. What's going on in your house, uh, around your yard, in your community that causes uh, a risk for you. And so there are lots of different resources that are available to us um, that can help you, things like checklists and things, can help you really assess your home environment for safety. And I have, um, uh, I can send you to those resources and share those. We have a question. I'd love to hear the question. I am looking to purchase a new walker in a wheelchair for my sister who has spastic CP. And I wanted to ask if there's a place in Northern Virginia where I could bring her to have an assessment and have her try different walkers before I purchase one. As it stands now, her primary care doctor writes an order and hands it to me to go buy one. We've bought several and none are working well. She is an OT and PT and they adjust the walkers, but I gotta believe that I can get one person to assess her and then recommend a specific walker. So I. If I was her PT, I would be the person. So it really sounds like um, if she's in OT and PT, I would start there. I would talk with the OT and PT because as a rehab clinician, one of the things we're educated to do is assistive device uh, prescription, fitting, instruction. And as far as a wheelchair, some PTs are better educated about wheelchairs and OTs, about wheelchair uh, seating systems and prescription than others. So in other words, there's a basic understanding among all rehab professionals, but some uh, get special certification in seating, um, uh, special certification in uh, seating systems and wheelchair prescription. And so that's what I would look for. And if your PT and OT uh, either don't have the certification that you want or don't feel comfortable prescribing the right walker, they should be able to make suggestions about a walker at least. Um, then ask them for a local seating clinic, wheelchair seating clinic. And if all else fails, my email is at the on the last um, slide that we'll present today or we can share it, uh, you can get it through Insight and then I can suggest a couple of uh, Northern Virginia physical therapists who do have some excellence in those areas. So I that helps. Yes, Amber said thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, so we talked about environmental factors. And then the last thing we'll talk about is fear of falling. So fear of falling. So I'll ask our audience here, fear of falling. Why do you think fear of falling would make you more likely to fall? Any ideas? Focus on that rather than what's going on. Yeah, you focus on that fear of falling rather than what's happening around you or, oops. Uh, if we think about being fearful of falling, then it really kind of hap uh, feeds into this negative cycle of things. So what happens sometimes is somebody will have a fall, right? So they have a fall and then they're scared that it will happen again. And even if they don't get hurt, there's a lot of fear associated with a fall. And if they do get hurt, obviously there's a lot of fear associated with a fall. So somebody has this fear of falling and it may happen because of a fall or it may happen because a friend fell or because you had a near fall or because you are worried that falls are inevitable as you age, which we know now is not true. And so it may, you may enter this cycle here with just the fear. But you have a fear, and so if I have a fear of falling, I tend to withdraw a little bit, and then I kind of am fearful about just moving, getting out, going out and about, maybe even moving around in the, the environments that were more comfortable for me before I became so fearful. And so if I have a fear of falling, and that leads to kind of this fear of moving, or I'm moving less because I'm so nervous about falling, then what happens is my body begins to kind of regulate to my lesser activity level. And so we always think about use it or lose it. If we're not up, active, moving, then our body says, eh, don't need to do that. And it regulates to this new lower level of functioning. 
And so now if I'm functioning at a lower level, I'm not getting up and moving as often, I'm not challenging myself, then that becomes what I'm capable of. And because of that, because I'm decreased in my activity, I truly do become weaker. So it's kind of like this self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm nervous about falling. And because I'm nervous about falling, I, I, my world becomes smaller. I move less. I function less. I interact less. And all of those things lead me to be at a higher risk for falling. Does that make sense? I got a slight nod from somebody in-house. So we're going to say, okay, sort of makes sense. Um, but this is huge for people. And this is one of the reasons why once you have a fall, your risk for falling goes up. So once you have one fall, then that adds to kind of our, our fall risk assessment. Because if you have one, you're more likely to have another one. But we can combat that. It's not a defense, not a done deal. If you have one fall, that could be your one and only fall ever. If you don't enter this cycle, but instead say, oh my gosh, I had a fall. What are the things that I can do to minimize the risk that that is going to happen again? That was not a good experience and don't want it to happen again. All right. So here's why you have done a talk here before at Insight. And this is like my dream. <laughs> and I always kind of um, put some, some creation of this slide up. I was then, right before COVID, I had an opportunity to um, speak at a conference in South Korea. And I was walking around in Seoul, South Korea. And do you know they have parks for older adults in Seoul? Mm -hmm. And you see people and they're up on these reciprocal and exercise things. And they're doing all kinds of calisthenics. And they're just outside exercising because there's a place to do it. And so, you know, I always think about when do we stop wanting to go play on the park? Like, when does that happen? And I think about that very seriously, actually. And I have a dog. And every time I take my dog out, I pass a couple of tot lots. And I routinely will make sure that I either walk on the rim of the, the tot lot or spin on the spinny thing because your tolerance for spinning can sometimes go down as you're aging. And so if I give myself a spin on the spinny thing a couple of times a week, that's, I think that's good for me. But all the different things that we could and should be doing, um, you know, climbing so that we can slide down, working on balance. You know, when's the last time you got on a swing? Like your vestibular system, your inner ear, We'll, we'll be like, what's going on if you get on a swing? Because it's been so long since you had to kind of regulate to something spinning or to being up on a swing and having that experience. I strongly recommend it as long as you can do it safely. Um, it's just healthy for us to maintain this level of activity, to maintain this variety of sensory experiences and then demands on our physical bodies. So lots of different things, you know, and I, you know, I kind of envision that this is, you know, we, a tot lot should be kind of this cross-generational place where we're really interacting and everybody's benefiting. It's not just, you know, a bunch of adults sitting and watching kids play on the equipment. I don't know. Anyone with me? Anyone? I yeah. play on a playground. There it is. Right? A lot of them will say, you know, you have to be a certain age or something. Yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> they have to be between these ages, right? You're right. Because they'll say, one of the top lots by my, um, uh, in my development, it says, like, between the ages of 2 to 12. It's like, once you hit 12, you're no longer welcome here. Mm. That's not right. I think they worry about those pesky teenagers. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, so don't walk by the tot lot without thinking twice from here on out. Um, so this is kind of a famous graph in, in, in any of the aging literature. We talk about this slippery slope of aging. So one of the things we, we were going to hit on today is just what happens in aging. And this is kind of an interesting concept because it's the, you know, age is across the lower 
um, part of the graph, the x-axis, so from age 20 to 100 plus. And then what we're measuring on the y-axis is vigor, right? How vigorous are you? And so when you think about that, we think about, well, at our peak in our young adult lives, I don't know, did you feel 100% vigorous when you were 20? <laughs> it's the theoretical framework for this. But it's this concept that we have these different levels of functioning that are associated with our level of vigor. And when you think about vigor, it really relates to many different paradigms. So it's kind of like your health and your social interaction and your cognitive capabilities, all these different things that are kind of um, put together to determine uh, how interactive can you be in your life to your own um, pleasure. Okay. And so we have like up high when you're based on this theoretical framework, this idea that uh, I'm 60% vigor allows me to have a lot of room to play. So it allows me enough reserve that I can function way up here and really enjoy. And then as your vigor decreases, which can happen with age if you don't do anything to combat it, then you go from this level of, well, I have so much reserve in terms of my physical health, my cognitive abilities um, that I am able to really enjoy. As you age, then maybe you don't have so much reserve left. And so now we're down here and functioning. I'm doing okay. I'm functioning, I'm caring for myself, I'm interacting in my daily life but I'm no longer capable of kind of this fun level, right? Because as I've aged, all my reserves have kind of been drip, uh, declined. And then, again, if things were, if, if this were the truth, if this were what happens, we get to a point where we hit frailty. So you, you've probably heard this term, and frailty is associated with uh, kind of aging when, when we are aging and we're not aging well, there's a risk that we become very frail. And when we're frail, we're not very resilient. And so if we're not very resilient, if something happens, if there's a challenge of some sort from a health perspective or a social perspective or a cognitive perspective, that can really be overwhelming and we may not recover from that. So this frailty place is a place that we want to avoid. And then finally, we get to a point where there is failure. We're no longer able, able to thrive at all. So this is called the slippery slope of aging. And so it's kind of this framework that we think about. But what, we're, what we really should be thinking about is our job, we've got one life, our job is to stay in the fun zone, right? We don't want to be down here where it's all I can do to get myself out of bed, bathed, dressed, fed, and then go to sleep and do it again the next day. That's what's kind of ha happening down there in the function zone, right? And once I'm in the frailty zone, then I need help to do those things, right? So we want to avoid these at all costs. We want to really stay in the fun zone. Who doesn't want to stay in the fun zone, right? We all want to stay in the fun zone. And so this idea of what can we do to manipulate this? What can we do to combat this decline? Guess what? We have good control over that. And really, a lot of those things that we said that were kind of modifiable risk factors for falls feed into this because those are things that we can modify, we can do that will keep us up kind of in the fun zone. Good? Okay. Anybody like to walk? Oh, everybody likes to walk. It's universal. Um, so walking is one of those things we can do intentionally and keep ourselves up kind of in the fun zone. And so as we age, there's lots and lots of literature about what changes in our walking as we get older. This is studied heavily. And so when we look at walking speed, which is one of the, the uh, biomarkers we use for walking. So when we look at walking speed, 
walking speed does uh, decrease as we age. And that decrease in walking speed can be really minimal. Actually, you may not decrease in walking speed if you're intentionally walking and maintaining good speed. But for most older adults, that decrease will, uh, will begin with over 65, and it'll continue to decrease as people age. And the other thing we look at is if we measure a bunch of people's walking speed and we compare the people with a slow walking speed versus a higher walking speed and we follow them over time, these are some of the things that we've learned. So people with a slow walking speed will, over time, do more poorly in cognitive tests. They'll do more poorly in their activities of daily living or their functional skills. And they'll do more poorly in terms of maintaining their independence over time. And these are really hard studies to do because they're longitudinal studies where you do these, do your walking speed test and other tests at one mark, and then you do it again, maybe two years later, maybe four years later, maybe five years later, and then you do it again, two or four or five years later, and then you do it again. And so to follow people over a long period of time is a huge investment. But there are several studies that have done this and have really helped us learn what are the kind of predictive capabilities of a, a decreased walking speed. And so makes you want to walk faster, doesn't it? Makes you want to maintain your speed um, because those things are correlated to maintaining good cognitive health, good independence, um, and good function. The other thing we know is that walking speed or decreases in walking speed are associated with increases or more hospitalization and institutionalization, so ending up in, say, a nursing home setting versus living independently in the community. And then finally, one of the things that's really important for us to know is that walking speed is associated with mortality. So the slower you are, again, when they looked at those those studies where they do walking speed here, maybe they measured it uh, at, at the baseline mark and then at four years and then at eight years and then at 12 years. Those individuals who measured more slowly at that baseline mark went on to have a much higher mortality rate eight years or 12 years later. In other words, they didn't live to see the data collection points at the eight and 12 year marks, okay? So this is important information for us to just kind of know how important something as uh, you know, non-threatening as walking can be. Okay. So I uh, just, with a group of colleagues, um, I just had this, uh, it's called an information and education page, just had it published. And it's called 10 Reasons to Walk and How to Get Started. And the intent of this, um, this page was that it would end up in your doctor's office. And your doctor would see you for your annual physical and then would say, hey, here, 10 reasons to walk. Keep yourself active. And so because I don't think your doctor's going to hand you this publication, I'm going to tell you what it says. And we can, if we do a blog on this, we'll put the table from this, um, this article in the blog. But walking is good. And we, this was done, I, have, I did this with seven colleagues. Uh, most were physicians. Uh, actually, I think three or four were physicians. And then a nutritionist and an exercise physiologist. So we were really looking at the literature and the data that supports how does walking help you. And so walking is good for your brain. It's good for your brain function. And in the article that we wrote, you know, it has the, the literature to support this in just in a little bullet form. So it's really easily digestible. Um, and we put the most important things we thought up front, the, your brain and your mood, right? Those are things that can really keep you in that fun zone. And so walking is really good for your brain and it's good for your, uh, your mental health. And, you know, then kind of came all the things that you know walking's good for. Like, you know walking's good for your heart and your lungs, and you know the weight bearing is good for your bones and your joints and your muscles. Um, the nutritionist really helped us by saying, you know, 
uh, the walking is so good for your uh, your blood pressure, your endocrine, or sorry, your blood sugar and your endocrine system, the 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 um, all of the chemicals in your blood. It can be good for your weight. Another thing that's important, and this is becoming more and more uh, in the general uh, kind of public service announcements lately, is the idea of how important sleep is. So sleep is so important for your mental health and then for your physical health, because it's that period of recovery. And so sleeping well becomes a big part of living well. And guess what? Walking, um, consistent walking is associated with better sleep. Um, and so that's good for us to know. And then lo and behold, people who are regular walkers tend to live longer. So they have better longevity. So we were talking about gait speed and how that relates to mortality. So this is kind of within that same uh, mindset that if we keep up walking, we're regular walkers, then we will live longer to enjoy all of these benefits of, of walking. So we have walkers in the room. If we don't have walkers at home, we're trying to win you over. All right, so let's talk a little bit about falls, because that was in our title too. And so uh, there are lots of things we said that we could do to prevent falls. So here are some really specific ideas if you're having any concerns about falling. I mentioned this before, but this idea of medications, you know, as we get older, what happens sometimes is we get a medication on board for something, and then we just get in the habit of taking it and then maybe nobody really ever says when you could stop taking it or whether you should stop taking it or whether there's something else that we could substitute for it. Or you take a medication and it has a side effect that you don't like or that makes you uncomfortable. So the doctor said, well, here, take this as well, because this will make that side effect more tolerable for you. So then you're piling medication on that you maybe didn't need for your health initially because of a, an organ system problem, but you took it because you're trying to combat the negative effects of a different medicine. Anyway, what happens is over time, you might have more medications on board than you need. And it's good on a regular basis to have your physician or a pharmacist really look at your list of medications and talk with you about how they interact with one another, what they're all doing, whether you need them or not. So there should be a discussion about whether these medications, you know, I went on this medication two years ago for this episode, and now here I am and I'm still taking it. And I don't know if I really need to, to be taking it. So this idea of reviewing it just makes good sense. So when you're with your physician or uh, work, where, wherever your pharmacist is, makes great sense to talk through your medications list um, and make sense of it. One of the things that we know is that certain types of medications make people more likely to fall and so certain combinations of medications can do that. And so who better to look at your meds than a pharmacist or your doctor, the person that prescribed a lot of the meds. The other thing that I'll say about that, and then I'll leave it, is that oftentimes we go to multiple different doctors, right? So you have your primary care doctor, but then you have a GI issue and you go to the, the GI doctor, and then you have a, a pulmonary or a lung issue and you go to the lung doctor. And while there should be kind of a central communication among everybody, there often is not. And so it may also be that your primary care physician doesn't know exactly all of the medications that you're on. Um, but that's why if you, uh, if you get all your medications through one pharmacist, that's really a nice way to kind of keep track of those things. We have a question. Good. Um, I am interested for my brother who either has Parkinson's dementia or Lewy body. He shuffles and recently he is very off balance. Can you comment on the progression of someone to his diagnosis? Not really. <laughs> I could if I could see him. Um, so. Uh, here's my comment. That's typical that, uh, you know, Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's disease dementia 
have the same kind of pathology. We just name those based on what showed up first, the cognitive problem or the physical problem. Uh, but the pathology, the underlying pathology is, is similar. Um, and we do see the shuffling gait, very classic. Uh, and we see that with Parkinson's and with Lewy body dementia. Um, I can't comment on the progression because it's really different for everybody. So the progression, uh, you know, one thing that might be telling is how long has it taken so from kind of diagnosis to now where you're really seeing changes in gait? Has that been a quick trajectory or has that been over multiple years? Um, that isn't always telling, but if, if that's been a pretty quick trajectory, um, then that would be uh, a little more daunting to think about that it might continue to be kind of a quick trajectory versus if it's taken a long time to get here, um, that it could take a while more before things are even more unstable. Um, what I'll suggest though, is that uh, the gait changes that we see with this type of dementia and with Parkinson's disease uh, can respond to focused physical therapy. One of the things we use is a lot of external cueing with Parkinson's disease and with Lewy body dementia, because one of the things that we see sometimes is that individuals with Parkinson's, they don't move voluntarily as well as they move in response to some kind of stimulus. So in other words, somebody may have a really hard time um, starting moving from a stopped position, uh, but if you gave them a target or a line to step over or a, a laser beam on the floor and said, step to this target, they may more readily be able to hit that target um, rather than internally trying to take that first step. If they have an external cue that says step here, that makes movement a little bit more, um, uh, a little easier for them. And so there are a lot of strategies that we use in rehab with people with these diseases that are based on a lot of external cueing. So even things like once they're up and walking, give them a beat, like whatever. So there's actually an app that you can find on your phone that will pick songs that have a certain beat. So you figure out what beat works and then you can go and you can get a list of songs that will hit that beat so that when he's walking, He's not just responding to a metronome, but he's got, some, you know, whatever music he loves, he's got that music in his headset or playing out loud. And so that type of thing, yeah, it's not practical when he gets up to walk to the bathroom, but it could be a great exercise component to keep him moving and walking more safely with bigger steps, uh, more stable gait. So there are... I hope he's in physical therapy. I hope you have a good therapist for him um, because there are some good strategies to try, you know, and in physical therapy, our goal is to make life easier, not just to play around with things that are going to work in our PT department, but things that are going to translate to the improved functionality at home. And so that's a, a, a big part of trying to figure out and pick and choose what's going to work with this person who's in front of me right now. Um, so yeah, I couldn't answer the question <laughs> what to expect, but um, but there's a lot of possibilities for improvement um, if you're if you connect with the right resource. Joe has a question. Good. Best balance exercises for patients. We're gonna get there, Joe. <laughs> Keep your pants on, Joe. <laughs> We're coming. <laughs> We're coming. Um, so yeah, let's talk about these, and then I have really some specific activities that we can engage in. Um, so yeah, we talked about the doctor, we talked about the pharmacist. Um, I mentioned before vision, and uh, I think it's really important. Vision is so important to balance and being upright and stable because it helps us kind of find the vertical. So we are able to use our eyes to figure out, okay, there's a wall, there's a window, there's the door, that's vertical. And so that helps me know this is upright. And that's why, did you ever remember going into like a fun house when you were a kid and everything is like on an angle and the floor is crooked? That's playing around with your visual input and that's why you felt so off balance when you were in there. 
So vision is a huge part of keeping us safe and upright, and that's why lighting is important. And so having your eyes checked regularly or just, um, you know, the other thing is keeping your glasses clean, like wiping your glasses down. Um, if you only have reading glasses, take them off when you walk, right? Or if you have bifocals, be really deliberate about where you're looking. Don't be looking through the bifocal piece when you're walking. And so these are things that make total sense, um, but sometimes we forget to pay attention to because we're just walking. Who, who needs to think about walking? And unfortunately, as we get older, we have to think more about it. Julie, do you sometimes, when you notice people having that issue with glasses, that you may request that they get their reading and their distance glasses separated. Mm -hmm. And actually that makes a lot of sense for a lot of um, people who have cognitive impairment. That's a really good strategy. Um, and you know, some people don't do well with, you know, now they have not just bifocals, but there's progressive lenses. So it's not just two, it's kind of like the series of things that changes. And so um, some people don't, I tried those, I couldn't adjust to them. I didn't, it didn't, work for me. So some people just don't really uh, tolerate that very well. And so if somebody has cognitive issues and they're not really in tune to where they should be looking, then it's very hard to know that, wow, when I look here, it's, it's going to distort what I'm looking at on the ground. So we have made that suggestion before that, that um, you know, when you're sitting and reading, these are the glasses that you use. When you're up and moving about, these are the glasses that you use. That's a great point. Um, so having your eyes checked. And then the other thing is um, when you go to your doctor, having, having your feet checked. So some people are really good. They visit a podiatrist kind of regularly. Um, but just the, the sensation coming to us from our feet is really important as well about uh, to, to stay upright. And Diabetes is very, um, you know, the, the prevalence of diabetes is very high in uh, the demographic of 65 and older. And so diabetes often leads to decreased sensation in your feet. So all of these things, um, you know, make me say when you go to your physician, just say, can you look at my feet, make, check my feet, make sure I'm good. Um, and go to your annual eye exam and make sure everything's good with your eyewear. Um, fall prevention in your home is a really important um, and uh, uh, something that you can adjust or you can change. And so really looking at your home with a new lens at what, what are the things that I could trip over? What are the things that are unsafe? What are the things that are not stable in the home? Is there a lot of clutter in the home? Um, are my pets poorly behaved? Uh, these are all things that um, can make the home a little less safe. And so uh, there are a lot of really good online checklists that you can use. The ones I like most are um, from the study initiative from the CDC. And we can, again, if we do a blog, we can link to those and you probably share them anyway. Uh, but you can just go through and look at your home with a little bit of a new eye. Of what are things that I, I, I could, maybe change and would make it a little bit safer. And now <laughs> what Joe asked, let's talk a little bit about um, how to maybe uh, give ourselves a little advantage about our balance and, and do some things from a balance perspective that might prevent faults. So we've mentioned this already, just move more. That's gonna be good for you. Sit less, move more. Um, and one of the keys to improving balance is that you have to challenge your balance in order for it to get better. So it's like you have to, you know, in order to build muscle, you have to kind of overload the muscle. In, in order to improve balance, you have to challenge your balance. And so we try to do things safely, but that really put the demand on you to really adjust and recover your balance. Uh, there are lots of community-based programs ever since COVID. You know, the one the one silver lining of COVID was the availability of so many virtual uh, resources. And you could go online and take Tai Chi online. Um, you can go online and do uh, all kinds of different programming. And there are lots of, we have the, the Northern Virginia Falls Prevention Alliance does has some programming online. Uh, Virginia Hospital Center, Innova, 
they all have different selections of online programming. Some, some at a cost, some free, um, but there, there are things available in the community. And then I'm always plugging for a, a, a visit with a physical therapist, which um, Medicare will cover a visit to a PT if your concern is about balance and falls and your physician says it would be helpful for you to see a PT. So that's, uh, and you should be getting an annual fall screening in your annual Medicare wellness visit. How about that? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Um, yeah. They should do an annual cognitive screen as well. Are they doing that? Uh oh. <laughs> Maybe at home. Maybe all of our participants at home are nodding. <laughs> Um, that's, yeah, I mean, that's a problem, right? I mean, that should be something that is happening within the Medicare system. And there's a whole algorithm for physicians to follow, both for cognitive screening and for fall screening. And at the very least, the, the algorithms start with, do you have any concerns about falls? Do you have any concerns about your cognition or your memory? So next time you go to your Medicare annual wellness visit and the doc says, see you later, say, hey, doc, aren't you going to ask me about my concerns related to falls or cognition? Okay, so here are, Joe, some specific things that you can do that could have an impact for you. So um, here's one that I think is really, this is like a magical little exercise that takes nothing. It's nothing from you. So what we do is there are some age match norms for your ability to go from sitting to standing. I have no idea if I'm in the picture or not. My, okay. So, and what we do is we look for people's ability to stand without the use of their hands. So we put our hands across their chest and we stand up and then we sit down. And can we do that in a uh, controlled fashion? There are a couple of different ways we test it in the clinic. One is how quickly can you do five times? Another is how many can you do in 30 seconds? So we look at different things in the clinic. But, and there are norms for that and there are associations with falls if you hit certain markers. Um, but here's what I think is so easy to do and that I, I always tell people to do at home. Going sit to stand, if you cannot go sit to stand without pushing with your hands, then a really good goal is to become less and less reliant on your hands. So if right now it takes a, a good push to get you up, that's fine, but the goal would be to try to work toward less and less of a push. And there are lots of different ways to do it. One way is maybe sit on, if you're sitting on something low, if you sit on something a little higher, it'll be a little easier. So you can start higher up and really work on no hands, but I'm up a little higher than I was, and now I'm coming up. So if you're working with hands, then the first goal is, let me see how much less reliant I can become on my hands. If you're able to stand up and sit down without holding on, one of the great things you can do for this, for your own leg strength and safety, and leg strength correlates to a certain degree with balance, is try to do it quickly, because that helps your power. So we, we look at our muscles and our muscles need power. They gotta be able to go fast and they need endurance. They have to be able to withstand the test of time. So for power, I try to do it quick. One, two, three, four, five. And that's power. That's working all the extensors really hard, really fast. And then I'm gonna work on endurance. And now I'm gonna, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You get the idea, right? And so when I do it slowly, then it forces my muscles to act over a much longer period of time. And so in this uh, example, they're really working on an endurance component. Power is really important in walking. And we underestimate that. And it's kind of a new area of focus in the rehab world, that the, the really predictable changes of gait or of walking, one of the things we see is older adults lose power 
And power, when you think about power in walking, I don't know if you can, can you see my feet? When you think about power in walking, it's that push-off piece where you really need power in those calf muscles. And it's not just the calf muscles, though. It's all the muscles that extend that whole leg. And so when you go sit to stand, guess what? Same muscles working. They're working just the same way. They're all fighting to really push and get you up, right? So there's a really good bang for your buck kind of activity. It's not really a balance exercise per se. It's more of a leg strength exercise, but leg strength correlates with falls in a way that um, makes us feel a little bit better on our feet. Uh, the other thing that we can do is challenge our balance, do it safely, but challenge our balance in an environment where we can maybe cover our hands so I could do it at the table or at a counter. And if I feel like I'm not going to be stable, I can literally hold on. But if I feel like I'm going to give myself a challenge, I can just hover my hands over whatever it is that I'm standing at, the counter, the table, and then work on things where I'm trying to balance or I'm trying to change my foot position to balance. And so I'm going to give you some examples of things that will like change your base of support, change your standing surface, or like we said, your visual input is so important. It makes sense that we should practice balance with differing visual input. So we're not so surprised when we get up to walk at night and we don't have all that visual input, okay? So let's look at a couple of things here. So base of support. So when we think about our base of support, we're just talking about how, we're, how are our feet organized under the weight of our body, right? So in terms of balance, Balance is all about maintaining our center of gravity, so like, like that one point within our body that would be central to everything, over the base of support. So we can challenge balance by moving the center of gravity, right, really changing it, or by changing the base of support, or by both, okay? So when we do those things, when we think of base of support, certain people need a really wide, stable base of support, right? And then this is phenomenal to me, like this whole ability to rise up and stay up in this static position and maintain that as she's centered over this little tiny base of support. So somebody like a lineman or a wrestler or um, you know, those individuals are used to having a lot of big, wide, stable base of support. And this is why, you know, if you are losing your balance, you strive for a wider base of support or you hold on to something because that increases your base of support. So when we think about how to play with that to kind of challenge your balance, one of the easy um, tools that we use in an assessment for this is called the four-stage balance test. So it's your whole foot is on the floor. And you progress from standing, and the test itself is 10 seconds in each position. But you progress from standing with your feet together, 10 seconds, and then your feet with one foot inside the instep of the other, and you hold it for 10 seconds. And you can balance with your arms if you need to. You can even hold on to something to get your feet in position, but the timing doesn't start till you let go. So 10 seconds here. And then usually the one that begins to fall apart for people is this one. So now we're in that position where we want somebody to stand on a tightrope and we have to hold it for 10 seconds. And this is from some of the research that we know, look at me, <laughs> this is um, from the studies that we've seen, this is kind of a deal breaker. If you can't hold this for 10 seconds, then you fall into a group that is at a higher risk for faults. Mm -hmm. And then if somebody's able to hold this for 10, 10 seconds, the next step is single limb stands. And can they hold that for 10 seconds? So this is really the, the one of the magic pieces for this is right here. And so what I like to do is practice. <laughs> so these types of things, changing the position of your, your feet, is a perfect way to kind of play around with base of support. Because this one's not so drastic from what you're used to. And so just getting your feet together. And then this one makes it a little harder because you're staggered now. And then this one makes it a lot harder. 
So playing around with that, but in a safe way where you're, you know, you're near something that if you're worried about your balance, you can hover your hands here, you can hold on if you need to, or near a wall. That's a lot of times I'll advise people if you, you know, this feels low to me, I might feel much better if I had a wall next to me. Um, I can even, when I have somebody in, uh, and I'm more concerned about their balance, but they, I want to challenge them, we'll find a corner of the house. So I'll have them function um, so that here's a wall here, here's a wall here. I'll have them work on their balance here with a chair in front of them. So they're kind of, they, they've got a little step. If they drift one way, they'll hit the wall. If they drift the other way, they'll hit the wall. If they drift forward, they've got a chair. So it's a very safe environment where you can really challenge yourself. And that's kind of the key, is making sure you have a little bit of a challenge. Another way to change base of support, though, is to make it so the whole foot's not on the floor. So just going up on your toes or going back on your heels. Those are other ways to, to change base of support and challenge your balance a little bit. And what we want is not one or the other. We want it all, right? We want to really play with all the different ways we can make it harder to stand up, okay? Right? And if it's too hard to do that, like I just put this in here because these previous pictures were like, look at how good she is at it. She's not holding on. But we can always position near a table or a counter and a counter or the wall to practice walking, walking heel to toe, backwards walking, backwards walking heel to toe. These are all really good activities to challenge you, but in a safe environment in a place where you don't feel threatened or like you're gonna fall. And then finally, another suggestion that I often make is uh, you can do things without making a big deal of it, right? It doesn't have to be, oh, it's time for my balance exercises. I can't believe I've got to devote this time to that every day. You just do it when you're not doing anything else, right? So I gotta tell you, I brush my teeth on one foot at least once a day. And the dentist said you're supposed to brush your teeth for two minutes. Did you know that? Right? So you can get a minute on each foot. You'd be standing there anywhere. And so working like when you're standing at the counter, and the counter is safe, right? You got one hand in your mouth, but you've got a hand for the counter. Um, and you're, you know, you put some water in the microwave so you can make some tea or, you know, again, you can stand at the counter and do some of these things. At the Target, at the grocery store, you've got the grocery cart right in front of you. You're standing there. Why not do some activity while you're work, you know, just wasting time? Why not do some of these things that will challenge your balance? It's safe. You can put your foot down and grab back onto the cart, but you can take that wasted time where you wouldn't be doing anything anyway, and you can make it useful. Um, one thing that I love to tell people to do is do like a clock exercise, but I couldn't find a clock when I went for a picture. But if you imagine you're standing and 12 o'clock is in front of you and six o'clock is behind you, to think about be moving around the clock. So you can do it tapping, like I'm going from 12 o'clock to six o'clock to nine o'clock to three o'clock, no, that's backwards. Um, so thinking about moving and tapping or just moving and trying to balance on one foot because this is a small base of support, but a moving center of gravity. So that hits both of those things we talked about before, it makes it really challenging. How do you like me now, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the other things that we can do is in the clinical environment, you'll see we, we break out the phone and we tell people, okay, you're doing fine on this solid floor. The solid floor gives you lots of really useful uh, information, really clear information about where you are in space. I know where my feet are because I feel this floor. But if I put somebody on a wedge of foam or a block of foam, all of a sudden, they're not getting that clear, crisp information about where they are in space. So everybody doesn't have foam at home, but guess what? You don't need foam. So you can just throw a couple pillows on the floor. You can use your yoga mat. You can take your dog's bed, um, throw pillows. All you're trying to do, look, look how easy. What? I don't want to put my shoes on the pillow. But 
So if you're on the pillow, all of a sudden, it's a little bit more challenging. Because here, all of the sensory receptors in my feet, in my ankles, they're telling me really clearly, this is where you are, you're good. But then I step up here and they're like, whoa, wait a minute, I'm not sure exactly where you are. And so you have to figure it out a little bit. So this idea of challenging your balance that way is not as intuitive. So people don't just know to do that, but it can have a really strong effect on your ability for when you're walking on grass or you're in an in, on gravel or in an environment that's not clear, solid, this is what you, uh, you know, this is telling you where you are in space. Good? That's changing the surface. And then, I can tell you, you're recording this though, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't tell my dad I was going to use this, but here's my dad. My dad, I gotta tell you, he turned 86 yesterday. He's aging with such grace. He is cognitively and physically invested in life. He does so many hobbies and things. For his 80th birthday, he bought himself a stand-up paddleboard. He was down on the Patuxent River. And this was how he practiced for it at home. So he stand up paddleboard, and I went down to visit him. He's like, this is what I'm doing. So he bought this balance, um, this balance board on Amazon. And he's just killing it. Awesome. And I tried it, and I won't even show you the video of who tried it. <laughs> um, he's amazing, right? So he turned 86 yesterday. He bought himself for his 85th birthday inline skates. He goes up to the parking lot every morning, and he gets a little bit of skating in before the rest of the retirement community gets up. So that to say, my dad's awesome. But also, there are other ways to really challenge your balance at a much higher level. If you want it, it's out there, and we can find it. Um, I've mentioned vision a couple of times, and it is important for you to think about if vision, if I don't have a great opportunity to see clearly, do my other senses help me enough, my inner ear or my vestibular system, my sensory system, do they help me enough that I can be upright and safe? And so a way to, to uh, get a feel for that is what happens when you close your eyes, right? So when you're with somebody, I wouldn't suggest doing this alone at home, but when you're with somebody in a safe environment, you will see that if you do some of these, if, if you're standing stably with your feet at shoulder width apart and you close your eyes, you may be fine. You may feel like, yeah, oh, I'm sweating a little bit, but I'm still very stable. But as you change your base of support and narrow it, and you take away the vision, because remember, vision tells you this is upright, and you take that away, and you'll definitely see you start to sway much more. And that's okay. That's what should happen. But if you practice it, you will sway less. So you can, this is something that is responsive to training. And so the other piece, too, to that is our inner ear or our vestibular system helps to coordinate what we're seeing with our balance and our ability to stay upright. So the other thing that's really important is practicing scanning your environment when you're walking so that you're not always looking at your feet, but you're getting this changing or dynamic visual input when you're walking. That's really healthy for you because normally, you know, walking is not something that we do in isolation usually. Usually we're dual tasking. Usually we're walking and we're thinking about something or we're on a phone or we're doing something else while we're walking. We could be walking and scanning, looking for something. So this idea of trying to kind of practice that, practice this scanning piece can be a really important um, way to kind of train the balance systems. And you can scan side to, scan to side and you can scan up and down. And then I mentioned dual tasking. So the idea of, of dual tasking, sorry, is that I'm walking, but I'm also thinking about something else. I'm walking, but I'm also using my hands for something else or doing something with manipulation. And this is really how we function. But we get it, we get more and more challenged by it as we get older. Anyone noticing more difficulty with dual or multitasking than you had 10 years ago? I am. 
So that idea of being able to really keep lots and lots of things in the forefront of my mind and be able to bounce back in between them and selectively attend to what's most important at any given time, that gets a little harder as we age. And so practice, we practice it, okay? All right, and so we really feel like to get better at balance, you need to practice. And to practice, you need opportunities to kind of lose your balance and then and then recover. So the trick is we gotta do a safety, right? There's nothing worse than working on your balance and having a fall while you're practicing your balance. That should not happen. So because when you're practicing balance activities, the first and foremost concern is, am I doing this safely? Am I doing this in a, an environment that works for me, right? If you're ever concerned about it, um, maybe it's time to see a PT or to, to go to a class where there's an instructor who can kind of talk you through. So a couple other pieces I wanted to mention that I think are really important. One of those is the real importance of being able to get down onto the floor and then to get back up off the floor. And there are... Um, Lots of indicators about what will make this easier, what will make this harder for people, what it means. Um, there are some tests about how many points touch the ground and how that relates to longevity. You'd be amazed. But what's important is you should be able to get down on the floor and to get up off of the floor because heaven forbid, what if you had to do it, right? What if you had a fall and there you are in the middle of the floor and you have to figure out a way to get up? Wouldn't it be so much better if that was a practiced activity? And so um, this is a mobility skill. It requires some strength. It requires good range of motion of your hips and your knees and your ankles. And so it's a really good therapeutic activity for people to, to really work on. <laughs> if you fall, so when we were first talking about this presentation, there was a, an inquiry about falling. Like what if, what if it actually happens? If you fall, the first thing that you should do and probably the hardest thing you do is just stay calm, right? You, you need to kind of inventory and see, am I hurt or am I just shook up? Because you definitely will be shook up. Like when you fall, it is so unexpected. It is so sudden. Um, it is alarming. So you're, you're going to have to kind of take a breath and get yourself under control so that you can take an inventory and see, am I hurt or am I just freaked out? And once you decide, am I hurt or am I freaked out, that'll kind of help you figure out which trajectory do I go on, right? So if you're hurt, obviously, if the first thing you're going to do, if anybody is within, um, you know, the immediate environment, is get help. Call for help. Um, when I work with people who have a high risk for falling, I strongly recommend to them that they keep their phone on their person so that if something did happen, and some people have like a Met Alert uh, okay. system, oh, yeah, Apple or watch. the Apple Watch, this day and age, right? So Met Alert system, a watch, anything that keeps you in communication. So if you're not laying in the middle of the floor, we've all heard the horror stories of somebody who fell, and two days later, the Adult son calls the neighbor and says, hey, I haven't heard from dad in a couple of days. Can you go check on him? And he's in the middle of the floor. He couldn't get up. So this idea of, um, you know, getting help, obviously, first step, and then trying to figure out, do I need medical services? So it may be a 911 issue. I think I broke my hip or I hit my head and I really need help or you're the person helping you thinks one of those things. It may be that you get up, but then you're just kind of feeling like uh, something's not right, in which case it might be appropriate to go to an urgent care type facility. Or it may be the kind of thing, well, let's just see how this pans out, and you wait till Monday, and you call the doctor's office when you go to the doctor. So these are the decisions that you're going to kind of make based on how do you feel? And how does the person who's with you or the person that hopefully you have supporting you thinks that this should go? Okay. The other thing is, if I do my little inventory and I'm like, I don't think I'm hurt, but I'm super freaked out. Then I'm going to need to figure out, okay, I got to get off the floor. 
And so for that, this is why it's good to have practiced it. But probably the most reasonable way to get off the floor, regardless of whether you practice it or not, is to get to some furniture, get to some stable furniture so that you can kind of climb your way off. And then you climb your way off the floor and then just sit. Just sit and decompress and, again, take your inventory. So if you fall, and, you know, it depends on who you read, but they, they generally say, um, you know, either one in three or one in four older adults will have a fall every year, right? So an older adult meaning over 65. So, you know, what do we got? How many we got on the call? I don't know. How many are on the honor call? We have 24. 24, 27 here. So there are going to be some falls in this group, right? And so the idea of knowing how to manage that is important. So I'll also say we're connected to Insight because we are connected to somebody we love who has this dementia or mild cognitive impairment or some kind of cognitive um, challenge. People with cognitive uh, impairment are at the most conservative, two to three times more likely to fall than their age match peers. There are a couple of studies that say they're eight times as likely to fall. It's a, it's a big number. So most conservatively, two to three times. They have an increased prevalence of falls, meaning a higher proportion of people with cognitive impairment fall than age-matched peers. They fall more frequently. They're more likely to get hurt when they fall. They're less likely to make it home if they're hospitalized after a fall. In other words, it could be the thing that leads to a long-term care kind of setting for somebody. Um, and they're more likely to, uh, to not survive a fall or this could qualify from a fall. Okay. So that's important. And that's kind of why I'm passionate about what I do. That whole last slide is I want, it, you know, it's all about for somebody with dementia, that's enough, right? They got the bad card. That stinks to have dementia, right? <laughs> So let's make everything else better. <laughs> let's really try to support all of the other things we can support, right? Because a fall can really change their lives. And we don't want that. We, want, and we don't want their lives changed in that way. We want their lives enhanced. And so really trying to um, do everything we can to maximize balance, to maximize mobility, to uh, make sure that they're maintaining good independence in their function. Those are all the things that I that have been my passion in the work that I do. So in thinking about maximizing function, um, one of the things we see in the world of dementia uh, care and in families of people who live with dementia is that families are so loving and so caring that oftentimes they do more than they should for the person with dementia. And sometimes, let's be honest, it's not because they're, it's not only because they're loving and caring, it's because they gotta get things done. Like things need to be done. The day is busy, we have places to go, people to see, things to do. And so sometimes, uh, you know, my, my stepmom had uh, advanced uh, Alzheimer's and it got to the point where it was just so hard for her to get herself buckled into the car. And so we didn't let her do it anymore. You know, who has time to wait for Bubby to buckle herself in the car? And so we went through a period where we, we just did it for her. And then I was like, why are we doing this with Bubby? We should be doing. If we're in a hurry, we'll buckle her in. We gotta go, we don't have time. But we'll take a couple times each week and we'll say, hey, let's give her the opportunity to buckle herself in the car. We'll guide her, we'll help her, we'll let her do it. Because what was happening was, if we always do for somebody with dementia, they're going to clearly lose the ability to do it. And it could be something as simple as taking your plate after dinner from the table and putting it on the counter or putting it in the dishwasher. And so because we just do for, the person with dementia loses the ability to do it. And it would be in everyone's best interest for them to maintain that functionality as long as possible. So they can contribute to the household, so they can feel independent. Um, and because you, it's, it's all about that functionality. And so being sure that we give people the opportunity to do things, even though we know it might take a little longer, even though we know it might take our own patience, 
um, that's really important. So sometimes we think, oh, they won't be able to do it. We have low expectations. Sometimes we think we got to get this done. We don't have the time. We often will over-assist because we think we're being helpful, but maybe we're not. And we just don't give them the opportunity to try the things they should be trying or doing. And that can be really problematic. Is we use things as an excuse. Their, their medications or their other health conditions, and we say, oh, we'll do this for. Um, and so we can combat this. This is called excess disability. People seem more disabled than they should with dementia. And so if we're patient, if we provide the opportunity, if we give lots of good cues and guidance, could be just you know physical guidance to get something done. Um, and then look, patient, opportunity, cues, opportunity, patience. I mean, it's all about opportunity and patience, really. And so thinking about those things um, could, could really help facilitate longevity of independence. All right, I had a research project that I could tell you about, but we're at about, we have about 15 minutes left. So I'd be happy to forego this and talk about what anyone wants to talk about, or I can show you some research that we've done. Any questions online? Nope. You're good. Yeah. Um, for me, is uh, my husband does live in a facility, and he does have Alzheimer's. Yeah, I've had PT come in. I know the things to do, but I'm having more and more trouble getting him to do anything. And he is definitely more unstable, so I'm a little... Like, I don't want to stop taking him out, but right. I'm more nervous about taking him out. Right. Yeah. And it, it really depends on, so there are different things you could do, right? In terms of you, you could exercise with him if you felt safe. That's when and I do that, but he, I can't even get him to do that mostly now. Yeah. Yeah. That's always hard. Um, so that idea, yeah. I mean, we, we, if we can make it, challenging but engaging right so really thinking about what is so the question i don't know if they could hear online was if, if somebody is maybe not their balance is decreasing they're in a a, a, a long-term care type setting and so what can we do to keep them keep their balance challenged while they're not at home with you and so uh you could do challenges with him while you're there, but if it's harder and harder for him to really engage in those challenges or he's not agreeable to it, we have to be creative and figure out what would motivate, right? One of the biggest things with people who have dementia, especially as it's progressing, is they have to see the saliency in what you're doing. <laughs> because you can't just rationally say, we're going to do these exercises because it's going to make your balance better. It's going to make you less likely to fall. This is good for you. Uh, you know, those things work with somebody who has cognition intact, but those, the rationalizing with somebody doesn't work when they have dementia. And so if there are things that motivate that are specific to him, that would be uh, something he'd be willing to engage in, mm -hmm. then that's the, the bend to put on it for whatever the activity is. You know, the other thing is, I have a project right now that I'll tell you about. Maybe, I don't know if you'd, be, you'd qualify for it, but I have a research project. Let me just tell you about my research project. So I have a research project right now. Let me skip through this and we can go back and look at it if we want to. Um, that is uh, taking balance training into the homes of people um, with a care partner. And so we're currently working on... Uh, recruiting individuals who have mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And this is sponsored through our Center for Optimal Aging. And so here's the background to this study. We, I've done several studies uh, here at Insight and other adult day health programs. I'm doing one right, right now out in Rockville with a captive audience of adult day health center participants. And it's great. We do balance training. They have fun. It's engaging, their balance gets better. I can tell you all that, right? And that's one of the projects I was gonna show you. There's data that shows their balance gets better. And uh, this is consistent with data we see from lots of other studies. 
But when I'm done and I take my research team home or back to Marymount, it's done because Insight doesn't have the abundance of staff. You know, I came in with four students and they don't have the staff that can really safely challenge the way we were challenging because we were challenging. And so we are trying to do something that we can do at home so that a care partner is more responsible. So we've got a project where they're running a, a balance training protocol. It's run by videos that we made. And so the person with dementia and their care partner is watching the video on Zoom, watching the video and participating with a researcher kind of talking them through it. And so it may be that something external and more engaging may or may not serve his purpose. And he may or may not follow but I'm just saying, we're trying to look for things that would we could take this remotely because we want something that will sustain. We want something that people will be, and, and not even, I don't care if people sustain in our project, but if they sustain and say, well, that wasn't bad, we could do remote exercise. And then they go to VHC or Inova or Northern Virginia Falls Prevention Alliance, and they find an online exercise program that they want to engage in. So... For you personally, it's that engagement piece. What would make it magically more enticing for him to participate? We have a question. Is there a minimum age requiring for that? 60. 60, okay. But I'd be willing to talk about it. <laughs> I also have two other questions yeah. that aren't related to that. Um, when should we get a special belt? Can't remember the name of it. To help belt. get someone up. Oh, okay, so to get someone up off the floor or just to guard somebody? It think? doesn't specify. Okay, but to get someone up, it sounded like. Maybe from a sitting position in a chair? Yeah, there are different pieces of equipment that will do that. Um, a, a standard gait belt is just, you know, for guarding or to give a little pull when you want to move somebody. can be helpful. There's not a magic time for that. It's when you think it would be helpful to you. And again... You know, not that I'm trying to push PT, I, I don't have an agenda here, mm -hmm. but physical therapy, um, you know, our PT colleagues are really trained in mobility and function. And so they may have tricks for you that will help with this. Um, do you turn people on to, um, oh, what is it? The TikTok and um, Instagram, Adriana. Um, be like care, I think it is. No, I have guided people towards silver sneakers, though. Okay, so there's also we're gonna put this in our we got a whole blog already. Mm -hmm. um, there's a speech pathologist who uh, is a dementia education expert. I think it's Be Light is her TikTok handle, uh, but she's on Instagram, TikTok. Uh, I'll send you a link to her website. Um, but in terms of tips and tricks and uh, equipment. It's an abundance of resources and all, all free to you. I think she probably does consultation for money, but there's so many free resources and you can, uh, I get stuck on her TikTok and I go, I can watch it for hours, just looking at all of the, the tricks and tips and uh, ideas she has. So she's a real dementia expert. Um, so anyway, so the project uh, that I'm currently recruiting for, for you 24 people in the audience and for the vast audience present. Um, if you have any interest in learning more about that, it's a funded project. All the information is on this website that I could send to you, but it's a funded project. Um, it, it does, uh, it's funded by the Virginia Center on Aging um, at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. And we're, uh, we're kind of fighting the clock for recruitment. Um, we have another question. Sure. I'm a caregiver for my nine, 95 year old who has dementia um, and she lives with family. She is a walker, but sometimes likes to walk around without the walker. Of course, we always worry she will fall. She holds onto the wall or furniture. Of course, there are three other adults who will say, use your walker, but any tips to help enforce this? So one thing, and again, um, the uh, Be Light, I bet has a whole page on this, but one thing that we've done that can be useful is to really um, personalize the walker, like kind of like I was saying about, you know, making a balance training program, engaging, individualized, make it something that will motivate this person. If there's something that 
your 95 year old mother would be really excited by or motivated to connect with. Um, I've done some kind of, you know, like tripped up walkers in my years where you're, whether it's color associated or, um, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, sign on the walker, it, it might sound cheesy, but for the right person, it can be a real motivator because it draws them to the assistive device. And so you would know better than I whether that might appeal, um, but that's one way to really make it um, more attractive. It might be she just doesn't look at the walker, doesn't recognize the walker, doesn't uh, address the walker because it's not within her registry. But if it were sparkly and shiny and bright and had her name on it, that it would draw her eye and make her more likely to use it. Um, I know something I've noticed, sometimes those mobility devices are brought in when someone's in the later stages of dementia and they can't retain what it is. So yeah. sometimes it's more of a danger than a help. Can be. And so the furniture surfing is just what works. <laughs> can be, can be, right? And so that's kind of another one of those individual calls where you're trying to figure out what's the best thing to do here. Because everyone, we, we all want the same thing, right? We all want the best opportunity for safety and mobility. Yeah, I'm, I'm climbing, if you've fallen and climbing up, do you have any suggestions for people who've had both knees replaced? Uh, shouldn't we get on their knees? Well, yeah. Um, so kneeling is not like the ideal right. position yeah, for somebody exactly. who's had both knees replaced. Right. Um, one thing that you can um, think about is the if you can get up from more of a side sit position. Uh -huh. So in other words, yeah, that really in, impacts the ability to crawl to the chair. So you would be more of a, in a side sitting position to move to the chair. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing would be true as you get into the chair, you try to come from a side sitting position. Mm -hmm. This position is optimal, but it takes a lot of mobility in the hip. And so if you're trying to come up from here, there may be like a brief time where you might be Mm -hmm. you know, resting on this leg, mm -hmm. but if you can help them get the other leg up as quickly as possible. So in other words, I, if I were doing it and I was like, oh, I can't put this knee, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Most people can't because I'm exceptional. <laughs> Most people just don't have the mobility. And so to get up to here, but then to cue, that's the time to get this leg up. That can really help with the motion to the chair. And that by doing that, I've never really been weight bearing on this knee. It almost looks like you need a lot of strength in your arms as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, well, this this piece here, by getting that leg up, like if I come here, I, I probably am using a lot of upper body, although it's a lot of hip force to push up. And so pushing in that direction. But once I'm here, this is where I'm, I'm coming. Yeah. 